It is one o'clock here. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Braddock and welcome to this special event. One more online event for you to attend. And I don't think it's an officially uh, a Zoom meeting until we've heard everybody's cell phones and somebody has to say either mute yourself or somebody will have to be unmuted at some point. We'll have to you know, advise somebody of that. Uh, but this is going to be a very good palate cleanser for me. If anybody follows along with what we do at quorumreport.com, uh, you know, we get down into the weeds of what happens uh, in the Texas legislature. But lately, it's been a lot of treetop stuff, a lot of superficial things. It's the Donald Trump show lately. We're not going to do that uh, during this event. Instead, we want to get into the issue of senior care in underserved populations in a post-pandemic Texas. And of course, being in a post-pandemic world, hopefully we'll be back to in-person events at some point. Although I guess, you know, we're going to have a mixture of these. People are going to want to do these in addition to in-person events, which I think is okay. You know, it, um, it gives us more flexibility on what we're able to accomplish. We've got some great panelists for this this afternoon. And I'd like to thank uh, our host, Kelsey Letcher, uh, for uh, having me, uh, as well as, as, you know, putting together this great panel to talk about such an important issue that was really, uh, Kelsey, you tell me if I'm wrong, but was really magnified, you know, during the height of the pandemic, uh, as things were really, uh, you know, just big question marks everywhere uh, over the course of the last year. Do want to let everybody know uh, that this event is being recorded, just so that you're aware of that, uh, and that we will take your questions uh, later in the program as we go through this until about two o'clock. And of course, we want to respect everybody's time and be done around two o'clock. Uh, but if you have questions, you can use the Q&A feature for that. Uh, and we will get those questions uh, to our panelists uh, throughout the course of the program. But uh, right now, I would turn it over to Kelsey Letcher, who is the uh, interim plan president at Molina Healthcare, uh, which is, of course, putting on the big event today. Kelsey? Thanks, Scott. Um, welcome, everyone. As Scott said, my name is Kelsey Letcher. I am the interim plan president for Molina Healthcare of Texas. And um, we are so excited to have you all join us today to hear from our panel of experts on senior care in underserved populations. Um, as, as Scott mentioned, certainly with the COVID pandemic, we are starting to reemerge as a state. We're excited to have the opportunity to do some virtual meetings, some in-person meetings, um, but we are grappling with the impacts and the lasting impacts of the COVID pandemic, um, but also using this as an opportunity to look at lessons learned um, and how we can provide care to underserved populations and our, and our seniors specifically. Um, we are really looking at an array of services um, that we want to make sure that we have to, um, access to, acute care services, behavioral health, pharmacy, and social services as well. Um, Molina is certainly committed to serving underserved seniors across the great state of Texas. And today I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Tom Oliverson, the chairman for the Texas House Insurance Committee, who represents Texas's 130th State House District in Northwest Harris County. Uh, Dr. Oliverson is a practicing anesthesiologist, and as you can see from video, he is actively practicing as we speak, um, and he is a partner at U.S. Anesthesia Partners. He is a tireless advocate for patients and their safety. Uh, Dr. Oliverson is recognized as an expert in office-based anesthesia and consults with doctors and dentists across the state of Texas to make um, office surgery for patients safer. We want, um, in addition to his medical success, Dr. Oliverson is active in organized medicine through the Texas Society of, Anesth of Anesthesiologists. As a successful small business owner, Dr. Oliverson understands that small businesses are the engines of our economy. And this business experience has taught him that American prosperity is best served through small business ownership and the spirit of volunteerism. So I would now like to invite Dr. Oliverson to share some off, um, open, opening remarks about his work in supporting seniors and underserved populations. Thank you, Kelsey. I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you today um, from my hospital where I'm practicing currently in the Woodlands uh, on call today, but I will say that I am currently not taking care of any patients. Uh, so don't don't worry, I'm going to have to get up and I always get that. Well, if you're at work, is there someone under anesthesia that you're not taking care of? So we're not not doing that at the moment, but I am here. Um, I think, you know, go back to where the pandemic began. I, I remember uh, mid-March of last year, as I'm sure many of you do, and it just sort of came upon us and it was sort of like, wow, OK, I guess everything's going to be shut down now. And what are we going to do? And I can tell you that as a healthcare provider, uh, the biggest thing that I noticed 
is that almost overnight, uh, things that were elective, things that were preventive and things that were screening in nature essentially ground to a standstill. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we've seen with respect to the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic now is just a, a fairly massive spike in the uh, amount of, um, sorry, I had an interruption there, uh, in the amount of uh, disease uh, that is not well managed, um, including serious medical conditions like cancer and heart disease where screening was missed uh, and the condition advanced. Uh, and so I think you know, particularly when we think of our senior population, we're thinking, at least I'm thinking of chronic disease. Uh, there were a lot of folks whose diabetes was not well managed, whose hypertension was not well managed because they were not able to get in to see the doctor, um, or maybe, you know, were afraid to go see the doctor uh, during the pandemic. And as a result of that, their disease has progressed uh, and the side effects and complications and secondary effects of that have gotten worse. So even though now we're meeting in person again, at least sometimes, and we're not wearing masks everywhere we go, uh, I think from a healthcare standpoint, what 2021 is going to continue to be about is sort of digging out of this backlog of preventive care uh, and sort of management care that was just not done, it was just postponed. Uh, and I think, you know, particularly when we think of medically underserved populations that are seniors, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the ability of telehealth and, and technology to sort of bridge that gap, especially when you can't be in person with somebody. And, you know, quite frankly, I would say that with respect to things like diabetes and high blood pressure and things like that, you know, management could be done over the phone or over technology. The problem is, and a lot was we've discovered, which is also the case in our public education system, is that not everybody has access to uh, broadband technology, not everybody has access to the internet. So I think, you know, when we talk about providing health care uh, to medically underserved communities, one of the big things we have to identify that we've never previously thought about is that we have a massive technology gap that now adds to that basket of difficulties and complications that somebody who finds themselves, um, you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged and elderly and in need of care for chronic disease has to deal with. So, so that's something that has to be addressed. There are infrastructure issues, which are separate completely from healthcare, but tie in now directly because of our increased reliance on telehealth and telemedicine. And I think one of the other things, and I guess I'll just sort of throw this out there and then maybe we can get on to the, the meat and potatoes of our discussion today is that I do think that there's a growing uh, awareness amongst uh, the medical community that social determinants actually go a long way towards determining somebody's health outcomes and somebody's um, potential predisposition to be affected or affected severely by a significant medical illness. Um, not having access to healthy food, not having access to safe house, housing, reliable transportation can certainly affect someone's access to, to healthcare. And uh, it may be as as so this continues to be studied, it may be that this may even be more significant uh, of a role than genetics would be in terms of determining who's going to develop diabetes, who's going to de develop cancer, heart disease, and, and how we manage those things going forward. And I guess finally, let me just say that the other thing I think is critical to uh, understand in healthcare and something that I um, I'm acutely sort of sensitive to is the idea that um, I don't know that in most cases, in most places, we have a complete lack of access to providers or healthcare services as much as healthcare has become increasingly expensive, even for uh, elderly populations who may qualify for federal programs such as Medicare. The out-of-pocket costs are, are going up and up and up, and we see this across the board, whether you're young, whether you're old, um, whether you're, you know, wherever you are in, in that healthcare environment, um, out-of-pocket costs are going up. So I always like to begin by saying that, to me, the biggest challenge we face in healthcare is a challenge of affordability, not access. Uh, the inability to afford the healthcare that we already have access to. Um, and it's no, no good to be able to go see the doctor if you can't afford the treatment either. And of course, that brings up the issue of pricing for hospital services, imaging labs, and of course, uh, my favorite topic, which is 
prescription medication costs. And I think I'll stop there. All right, Dr. Oliverson, thank you. By the way, it's always good to see you, whether you're at the hospital or on the house floor. Uh, you know, it's you, always, always great to work with you, sir. And, it, you know, I think, and I appreciate those comments. I think that, you know, over the last year, Kelsey, uh, Molina has done so much work and had to get really innovative, right, about how care was delivered to people because of this crisis that we've all been living in, hopefully coming out of this as the vaccination is more evenly distributed across Texas and the United States. But can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Scott. And, and Dr. Oliverson, thank you for, for being with us today. It certainly, um, it, it, you know, you resonated with me and you talked about just social determinants. And um, I think that, you know, just for y'all that don't know, um, Molina Healthcare of Texas, we serve about 550,000 Texans um, across the entire state. And we're fortunate to get to work in the Harris service area as well. Um, we are in Medicaid and CHIP and Marketplace and Medicare as well. Um, in Medicaid, we serve about 225,000 members, and many of those members are seniors who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, you know, as, as Scott said, we, healthcare did look a lot different this year, and we certainly did have to contend with some of the broadband issues that Dr. Oliverson said. So as we start to check in with our, our members who are experiencing isolation or food insecurity, um, you know, Texas not only had COVID, but we also had a, a terrible winter storm um, that really impacted a lot of our members as well. Um, and so, you know, we we donated a lot of money to um, Feeding Texas, which is a food bank here in Texas, to try to support um, serving uh, families and, and seniors who had food scarcity. Um, we do see that although we do provide access to quality providers, that a lot of the time, as Dr. Oliverson said, it's not really just those um, providing services that social factors certainly pay, play a large role in the health outcomes for our members and sometimes even upwards of 80% of their health outcomes. Um, so having access to, to, to healthy foods um, and also, you know, we, we also try to help our members um, access jobs. So it's not just about, you know, being able to have food, it's being able to be self-sustaining and to be able to support your family and yourselves. Um, and we also provide services to our members in their home to, to allow them to be cared for safely in their home. If that's, you know, providing a wheelchair ramp uh, so that they can, or, or having ADA um, large, larger doors, those are all things that we can help support to make sure that our members can live safely in their homes. Um, we also help to get members to doctors of visits. We help to arrange transportation. So that brings me to today. I want to um, bring you all, uh, I'll let Scott introduce our panelists, mm -hmm. um, but we specifically chose this topic because seniors in Texas are a growing population. They represent some of our society's most vulnerable. Um, COVID certainly dealt a new challenges for us. Um, and that led to some delayed care. We've got to get folks back on track with getting those preventative services. And it also led to a lot of isolation, um, certainly for the, the senior populations as well. In Houston, a lot of great work was done over the past year. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that today, but more importantly, we'll talk about where we're going. Um, so with, with, Scott, with that, Scott, I'll turn it back over to you to introduce our panelists and get us going. And uh, Kelsey, thank you so much uh, for those comments and for bringing together this wonderful group of panelists to talk about this. So much experience. If people can see my notes, the, uh, the, the bios of these folks is so impressive and just a wealth of knowledge that you put together this afternoon for people to learn more about this. And if the panelists who are going to be speaking could uh, turn their video on so everybody can see it if you're if your camera is working. Uh, we have Dr. Angela Goins, I believe I'm saying that correctly, his lecturer of social work in the social work program under the College of Public Service at the University of Houston downtown. She's been a licensed master social worker since 1996. And uh, some of her past work includes more than 19 years of direct uh, frontline experience as a supervisor investigator as well under uh, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services uh, and with Adult Protective Services as well. We're glad that you're here. Uh, Shemaine Barrow is the executive director of the Coalition for Barrier Free Living. Uh, Houston Center for Independent Living, uh, Brazoria County, uh, CIL Angleton, and Fort Bend, uh, CIL Sugarland. She's also an individual with a dis disability as well, and a mother of an adult daughter who is in a wheelchair, which gives you the kind of experience with this that, you know, you can't, you can't learn that in school 
believe me. Uh, and Lex Frieden, a, a professor of biomedical uh, in, informatics and also a professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, UT Health. Whenever I say that out loud, I always think of Dr. Red Duke. I'm not sure why. Um, and he is adjunct professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, one fun fact, uh, Dr. Red Duke, by the way, did, uh, did uh, treat my daughter at one point when she had a, an illness that they just couldn't figure out. He walked in and immediately knew <laughs> what the deal was after months of trying to figure it out. Um, appreciate all of you. Uh, joining us this afternoon. Of course, the, the, the uh, resumes of these folks, you can Google them. Believe me, they, they put together this panel for a reason. They know what they're talking about. Uh, let me go first to uh, Dr. Goins. And if you could just give us an overview, what you think, you know, the 30,000 foot view and drill down as much as you like uh, on, you know, today's senior population. And I think this is one of those things where people make a mistake, right? They think this is only about seniors, but it really is about everybody, isn't it? It is. It is quiet. You know, we're all aging, whether, you know, my students or anybody want to hear that or not, we're all going to be older adults or we know an older adult that's in our life, our, um, a loved one. Um, I think the pandemic really highlighted the vulnerability of this population in the country and just, you know, many of the needs that are out there for them. But just to kind of give you um, an overview or a snapshot of today's senior population, the U.S. Borough Statistics reports that by 2040, an estimated number of people ages 60 and older will rise to about 102 million. And that's a lot. That's nearly 27% of the total US population. So just over about a fifth, we're, you know, we're getting there now. Uh, as of 2019, over 54 million seniors in the US were 65 years or older. So for the first time, there are more older adults in our country than there are children, which is a pretty interesting statistic. Um, you know, like Dr. Olverson was saying, you know, medical advances, people are living longer. However, um, you know, there's those gaps and those pockets of individuals who aren't getting the attention that they need. Um, the current 85 and older population in the U.S. is one of the fastest growing ones. And we've been seeing that increase here in Houston Harris County by 15 percent since 2010. Um, you know, today's older adult population spans like 40 years. It, and it's comprised of like the silent generation, those individuals who were born between 1928, 1945, and then our baby boomers, not, not to forget them, the ones between 1946 and 1964. So those two generations make up our current senior population in our country and here locally. Um, compared to previous generations, um, they've had the most wealth but they've also had the most debt. Um, social and historical circumstances have created this kind of self-reliant culture, you know, pull ourselves up from our bootstraps, you know, which is a wonderful mindset. You know, they kept their head down, they did their work, they didn't say anything. But the, the problem with that can be is that when they do face challenges, many don't want to reach out and ask for mm -hmm. help, or they don't know how to ask for help or where to ask for help. And so, um, you know, we're seeing the numbers here in Houston Harris County just uh, expand. Uh, to just kind of give you a visual, the older adults in Harris County alone could make up like the seventh largest city in Texas, just behind Corpus Christi and right before Arlington. Um, you could fill the Reliance Stadium with the number of older adults in Harris County alone like eight times because there's like 540,000 older adults just in Harris County. That's just All a right. county. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people aren't aware of that. More than half of those county residents are, uh, are from a racial or ethnic minority. Many continue to experience the effects of a lifetime of uh, societal challenges, low social security uh, payments tied to low wages or jobs, underreported income. You know, almost one in three adults lives alone. Um, you know, older adults are, are living longer, like we said, nearly one third were born in other countries and may not be covered by the community safety nets that, that other populations or other segments of the population are getting. And here in the last decade, over 140,000 people who are older adults have moved to Harris County. So a lot of those people are potentially disconnected because their families live in other states or uh, they just don't have that support. So yeah. while many lead full and happy lives, they struggle to meet their basic needs. So that just kind of gives you an idea of why it's just so important that it just doesn't affect one individual, it affects us all. 
uh, with the economy, how and what services are needed to be provided to, to these folks, whether it be healthcare, transportation, which is a huge deficit in Harris County um, right now. Yeah, and you know, I can tell you personal experience, a friend of mine, her grandmother is 94 years old, living in independent health uh, care, uh, independent uh, facility, and um, her independence, let me tell you, you know, she, I recently, uh, I was having lunch with her um, just yesterday, and she was telling me about it. all my friends have, have passed away, you know, it's very somber, I was like, well, you have me, I'm your friend, but, but just that connection to people, so yes. important, right, I mean, it's, it's um, and so we spent some time, and um, she's just a wonderful lady. Um, I appreciate it, Dr. Goins. Uh, Shemaine, if you uh, would like to jump in on this and maybe share your thoughts about that, the importance of the independence uh, to the senior population. And, you know, you could um, also talk a little bit about how managed care helps to facilitate that. Sure, Scott, and thank you for having me today. I'm sorry I'm mm -hmm. having uh, vision or, uh, video issues, so okay. I'm just going over the phone. But um, independence and freedom are very important to the senior population to maintain their quality of life, as we know. And when you think about it, human beings of all ages, including seniors, um, all of us are really created to finding that fulfillment in our community. So you talk about being able to go and, and be with people and not be isolated. And so I really believe that it's up to all of us, uh, Centers for Independent Living, like where I work, and the NCOs alike, to empower those seniors to manage their health and their wellness. Um, within their supporting networks, their health care service providers, and the community as a whole. We must also value and ensure dignity, personal strength, and self-determination for our seniors, as they are the very core to the very success and sustainability of any long-term services and supports that are provided. MCOs can also further facilitate independence by ensuring that seniors have choices, they have access and full integration into activities in the community, they're very meaningful and fulfilling for each individual senior. Seniors should also be supported by managed care organizations um, and provided with information to assure that they're able to make informed decisions during interdisciplinary meetings and any assessments that concern that senior's needs, their abilities, their preferences and values. And they should also work with the senior and the team to coordinate services and support that the consumer needs to remain or increase their independence in the community. This includes helping to provide personal attendant care assistance and also long-term services and support um, that somebody needs to remain in their home um, with those community-based services. And seniors have uh, that have been served here at HCIL, they often express that they prefer to live in their own home or in the comfort of community settings, which, which uh, most folks do. So several NCOs currently partner directly with HCIL, including Melina, to increase the senior's independence through our relocation program. And that's a program that assists people with disabilities and seniors with disabilities in transferring out of nursing homes and back into the community. And so we really value this partnership with the MCOs and our continued efforts to enhance the quality of life and independence for the seniors that we serve. And we're very happy to be here and on this panel today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate that. Um, Professor Frieden, if I could turn to you, and I don't know if you I don't know if your video is working or not. I, I'm not sure if it even matters, but um, if you could turn it on, that would be cool. Um, uh, you know, on on that point that Shemaine brings up and maybe transitioning a little bit here to the social determinants of, of health. Can you talk about any of your findings on that and and how it does impact the seniors out there? Yeah, I think I, I, I'd be happy to, Scott. First, let me say I'm honored to be on the program today with you and the panelists. And thank you for having me. The, uh, yes, sir. Social determinants of health, as Dr. Alverson said, really have as much to do with good health for people as uh, uh, being able to make a clinic appointment. Because in fact, if you're not able to get to the clinic appointment, you will never make it. Uh, the social determinants of health involve housing, transportation, uh, care in your home, food to eat. and. Uh, uh, more people with disabilities in the Houston area and older adults in our community are affected by the social determinants of health challenges than you might expect. We have recently done uh, some surveys at uh, Tier Memorial Hermann Hospital, and we have discovered that many people living throughout our community, throughout Harris County and the surrounding communities, are not able to get access to needed transportation. 
sometimes it's not because there's a, a vehicle absent, but it's because the infrastructure is so broken up, they can't get down the sidewalk to the bus stop. And we don't seem to think about those things when we're trying to build accessible communities, I don't mm -hmm. think. Uh, we have so many food deserts throughout uh, the population of people who are living in low-income housing. Where do they get food? Um, Meals and Wheels is not appetizing for everyone every day. And uh, what alternatives do we have uh, to caregivers? Uh, many people are not able to get caregivers in their home. And if they have to pay themselves or if they have to supplement the payments, and this is an important point, Scott, our, our Medicaid program in the state is very generous and working with the MCOs, we are able to move funding into the caregiving arena, but mm -hmm. many of those caregivers are underpaid. If they have right. the opportunity to get a job at Starbucks, they get paid more there. If they have the opportunity to do housekeeping, they may get put, paid more there. So many people with, with disabilities and older adults are sort of forced to, under the table, supplement the, the, the funding provided to their caregivers. How, how can we rationalize that? And how can we help these people? And how can we ensure that the money that's spent goes to the caregiver and not to these intermediary agencies that uh, take $25 an hour and actually pay the caregiver half of that? Um, so there are many issues we need to address in our state, Scott. No doubt about that. And I appreciate those comments. Uh, Dr. Goins, if I could go back to you, you co-founded uh, the, the co-direct care initiative, the University of Houston downtowns collaborating on aging resources and education. Can you tell us about that, what, what the work is there and, and how that's going in the community? Yes, Tammy Mermelstein and myself, we uh, created this um, here at UHD with the focus on four areas, student involvement, research, education, connection. And so CARES created meaningful opportunities for students to engage with older adults and provide support to student caregivers um, among this vulnerable population. And the first week alone, when we started what we call this UHD Student Caregiver Initiative, we had like 22 students reach out to us and say, hey, I'm taking care of an older adult. I'm going to school, I'm working, and they were asking us for resources. And so we've been able to provide resources to those students. Uh, we also developed, especially during the pandemic, the adopt a grandparent program to connect older, older adults with students to improve that intergenerational uh, relationship and decrease loneliness over the phone for them. And that has just been such a gem of a project for us to be able to create where our students reached out and they learned something about the older adult and the older adult got socialization. And, and uh, one of the more touching stories that we have was a, um, a student who had a 14 year old daughter and the grandparent was raising a 14 year old grandchild. And they were able to relate over that, that, that experience of raising a child of the same age. Uh, we're also doing research, collecting evaluative data on our adopt a grandparent program. Uh, where we are hooking the students up with the older adults and we hope us to publish our results real soon. Uh, we've created a care index to identify communities most likely in need or additional community services and education, mm -hmm. especially for those underserved, underserved populations. So we can look uh, zip code by zip code in Harris County and tell you exactly where transportation needs to be you know, bumped up for seniors because we saw a lot of that to where we had a lot of seniors refuse to go to the doctor because they were afraid to leave because they would get, you know, the, the COVID. And so a lot of them didn't leave their homes and they didn't know where to turn. So we got some calls on that for transportation. Um, we also do what we call tough conversations in aging, where we go to, uh, we've gone to the U of HD community, faculty, staff, we've reached out to uh, home health companies, employee assistance programs, where we talk about the top 10 um, issues that are most pertinent, you know, to families working with their older adults, whether it be, yeah. how do you talk to someone with dementia? When is it time to take the keys away? So different things like that. So we educate the community. You know, such tough things, you know, um, that my friend, she had a little fall in the bathroom the other day uh, at, the, at the restaurant. Uh, her, her granddaughter was helping her uh, go to the restroom and, you know, she's just determined it, what she stood right back up. She's got her walker and she was walking back to the car. 
no help, you know, that, that they, they need that. They want that, yeah. you know, there's proof. Yeah. And uh, her granddaughter says, she's proven a point now, I think. I said, well, yeah, she is. <laughs> exactly. That's probably what's keeping her going. <laughs> right. She, that, I mean, she, she needed to do that. Um, Shemaine, with your experience in all of this, can you share with us what you think the biggest challenges are, you know, in, in, in helping these underserved populations? Well, sure. Let me just say first that I really love some of the programs that Dr. Goins just described and the hurdles that we see here. Um, some of the panelists have already touched on several of these, but um, the ones we've seen here at HCIL, um, as far as connecting seniors to the resources for overall health and well being, um, one of the biggest is economic stability. Um, and that really includes the cost of like monthly living expenses, housing, utilities, food costs. I've heard healthcare uh, described as far as medication, medical bills, and transportation. Uh, housing is especially challenging for many of the seniors that we work with. Many of them are on fixed incomes, and they're all already paying at least 30% or more um, for their housing. So a lot of times we see them struggling. Do they pay their rent? Do they pay for food? Um, do they pay their medications? They're often not doing all three. And so it's very difficult, and seniors are often confronted with some consequential choices due to the high cost of housing they face. Um, so in, in, on top of that, a lot of times just the lack of affordable and accessible housing compounds that issue because mm -hmm. they may not be able to afford to really stay where they are, but there really isn't a lot of housing um, available that, that's affordable and safe in our community. Um, besides that, another problem we have is education, especially as it relates to navigating those various healthcare systems um, paying for accessing care, whether it's something like uh, limited access to services, and you might see that more in our rural uh, communities, but also lack of transportation. I think Lex mentioned that earlier, you can't get there. Um, so if you have the resources that are available, it's very hard to be independent in your community if you're unable to get around your community. I guess that's mm -hmm. the point I'm trying to make. Sure. Uh, seniors living in those rural parts of the community often face challenges accessing and using transportation. Uh, and maybe it's just not available in some areas. And that can impact their health or quality of life, limited public transportation. Um, options were also increased during the pandemic. You know, a lot of, a lot of those Metro lift uh, rides were shut down, for instance. And this too created additional challenges to the independence of the seniors in our community. And as we were speaking of the pandemic, I was thinking we all know about the significant causes uh, barriers that impacted the health and wellness of older adults. For example, many of the programs uh, were closed to begin with in an effort to protect the health and safety of older adults. But while that may have helped to protect the health and safety, it also increased isolation and loneliness for those seniors. And so now a lot of times they face their whole day spending at home with little interaction to the outside world as they were forced to social distance and quarantine away from their family and friends. And so HCIL and a lot of other organizations and agencies moved to virtual service delivery. And we offer programs through technology and telephone meetings like we were talking about earlier. That in turn may have helped to answer the ability to provide those services. But again, it really also created some other issues because we, we really saw really clearly the long-standing long -standing digital divide that faced many seniors. Some of those issues faced include a lack of access to technology, the devices, the knowledge and comfort of using those devices, and access to the internet even. I mean, a lot of folks mm -hmm. didn't, didn't have access to Wi-Fi or computers in their home. So these problems in turn created more experience of social isolation and inequalities in access to programs and services. And that was really, you know, that, that may have been a problem before, but it's really very clear um, when the pandemic struck. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Professor Frieden, I think, you know, uh, when, when we're speaking about the pandemic, uh, and I think this is true across sectors and in healthcare, and of course, in senior care specifically, there are things that, you know, came out of this that are going to make lives better. There are other things that are going to frustrate people going forward, but certainly some things that, you know, all across that are going to be with us for a long time, right? And, and what do you think? What, what do you make of where we are with some of the changes that came out of the pandemic or over this past year, and what does it mean for us going forward long-term? Well, I, I agree 100% with Dr. Oliverson. His, his uh, observations in that regard are pertinent. First of all, the, the telemedicine that we were able to use during the pandemic, that must be sustained because people 
don't need to be waiting in clinics for a conversation with a doctor they can have over the uh, telemedical platform. Uh, that's very important. Secondly, telemedicine is not the solution for everything. Uh, my wife and I both ha are having surgery this year as a result of items that were left unchecked last year during routine health visits that were missed due to the pandemic. And so the, the need to in, reinforce people getting hands-on care when they need it and doing preventative medicine is very important. And we've learned that. But I think, you know, of extreme importance is this whole issue of institutionalization. People build a nursing home and they call it an independent living center. A nursing home is not a place where people make independent decisions. Independence is making choices based on acceptable options. If you don't have the opportunity to go out to the movies one day because you don't have access from that nursing home, you're not living independently. If you can't decide what clothes you want to buy at pennies, you're not living independently. So that's a misnomer. And we pay thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to put people where they would prefer to be living in their home if we had appropriate systems of community-based services and supports. So, so my one piece of advice, Scott, to, to legislators, to clinicians, to anybody who is so-called helping people with disabilities and old adults is ask them, listen to them, mm -hmm. ask people where they want to live and then help to facilitate that. If we were using the same amount of money in Texas to support people living independently in their own homes by giving them the needed supports they need there, rather than spending that money on high cost institutions, most people would be much happier and they would be able to be integrated better with their family and friends. Um, you know, that's my biggest uh, keep with you here, okay? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I hear you. Um, Dr. Goins, can you give us some of your frontline experience? I mean, put it in perspective from that standpoint, working with folks over the course of the pandemic and before and as we come out of it as well. Um, and what are some of the challenge? What are some of the challenges you think that people are just not aware of because they don't have that experience? Well, when I've, you know, visited, when I have visited older adults in the pandemic, and I've, I have visited quite a few, I've observed such a mixed um, bag of emotions from them, you know, they were the hardest hit population. I saw a statistic last week that 80% of the deaths in the country were from that segment of individuals 65 and older. And so most of them are scared, they're isolated, they're lonely. Um, some have lost loved ones to COVID, spouses, significant others, even their own children. And that's very hard when an older adult loses a, an adult child. Um, they're mourning not only those losses, but the loss of their independence and, and that they knew. I mean, I mean, literally overnight, we were talking about the pandemic and we weren't talking about the day before. And so they stopped being able to go to church. They stopped engaging in senior activities. They stopped going uh, to the grocery store. So their way of living pretty much cease to exist. And so they're still navigating that. So there's a little depression going, you know, depression and sadness uh, connected to, to the loss of the things that they used to do. Uh, some of them have reached out to family and loved ones to kind of bridge that isolation. Some of them have gotten creative. A lot of them don't have the technology though to even do appointments for telemedicine. And so, you know, I was talking to a lady on the phone the other day, you know, she's like, uh, what my doctor, thought was a rash wasn't a rash it was something more serious but is what she saw over the telemedicine wasn't accurately diagnosed and so so she has that added fear now of, of having the wrong diagnosis so they're happy to see me because for many of them I'm the first person they've seen in months and for some in a year I can't I feel like we're in some kind of sci-fi picture you know that we're in a society now that seems so disconnected to one another so it's just been very very hard but I see resiliency and hope there too. And I see, you know, and I think that's a part of that, that you know, reliance that they have on themselves, but I think we could do better to support them. 
Uh, Professor Frieden, can you talk about your experience having, you know, dealt with, uh, you know, I mentioned Dr. Gohan's been on the front lines. You were on the front lines, you know, legislatively uh, in helping to draft the Americans with Disabilities Act back in 1990. Looking forward, what do you think? What are the next big steps that need to be taken as we address all this? Well, I actually believe we need uh, legislative support for in-home services I think we, you know, we have an infrastructure in our community for police and fire. Uh, we deliver uh, assistance to people in their homes in the case of, of a break-in or in case of a fire. And uh, I think we should be able to deliver services to people in their homes as needed. Uh, it, uh, the cost would be exorbitant if we expected the public to pay for all of it. But many people have to spend down in order to be accessible have access to Medicaid services. And oh, sure. if, mm -hmm. if we had, you know, if we had the opportunity for people to share, use some of their savings to share in the cost of uh, better quality life at home, I believe they would. And, uh, and I think the uh, opportunity for us to ensure that there's an infrastructure where volunteerism can support uh, paid caregivers throughout our communities, I think we would improve the quality of life for everyone. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Kelsey, uh, if I could bring you back in here, you know, I mean, just pegging right off of what he just said, uh, you know, can you talk about the kind of work that y'all have done trying to address these things, improving the health outcomes for these folks? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think having managed care really provides an opportunity for us to drive quality health care. Um, you know, we can reward providers for providing high quality care through pay for performance programs, which in turn then allows our seniors to go see high quality providers. Um, but we also offer service coordinators for our members. So I'm, I, you know, it's interesting hearing a lot of the panelists today talk about just navigating a challenging healthcare system. And through our service coordinators, they really can help them, whether that's finding a provider or if it's scheduling a doctor visit or navigating transportation or even assessing for some of those social determinants of health that really could help our members live happier, healthier lives safely within their communities. Um, those service coordinators really are kind of the eyes and ears of our program, and we have them throughout all of our regions to help support our members. And, you know, we talked a lot about um, individuals who are living in nursing facilities who want to transition back into the home. When we have any members who are indicating to us that they have an interest in returning back to the community, we have an entire service coordination team that we call the Money Follows a Person team that really helps to make sure, you know, if a member of ours says that they want to return, what is it that they need to help support them so that they can return safely into the community? Um, and they start to develop all of those in a work plan so that they can make sure that before the member even arrives in their home, that all of those services and tools and resources that they need to live safely within their home are already there ready and waiting for them. Um, and so I think that that's something that's you know unique for managed care. It's something that Melina is very committed to. Um, and, and um, you know, I think also as we look at the ways that we can support our members, we, we do provide home delivered meals for some of our members who are homebound. Um, and we also provided, you know, PPE um, for our members as well. And then we talked a little bit about housing, you know, Molina actually has a partnership with um, an housing organization where we fund um, on-site uh, case managers to really help us see what's going on day to day in the lives of our members that are living in those um, housing communities because although you know we have service coordinators that are certainly available it's great to have somebody there real time all of the time to kind of see what's going on um, and we have regular check-ins with them we've actually since pivoted with this um, housing partner that we work with to now start doing housing navigation so if we have a member who is facing some housing insecurity it's best to work with the people who know housing housing well. You know, they speak the language, they know where to look. And so they're helping us now to try to locate housing for some of our members who are facing housing insecurity. And I think all of that's really available um, just through managed care. And we're excited to get to, to do that with our members. Absolutely. And, you know, as we uh, head toward the end of the program here, which we're going to wrap up around two o'clock, and if folks do have uh, questions in the audience, you can submit those through the, the Q&A. Uh, function there on uh, Zoom. Um, look, we've talked about where we are, where we're going, where we're going, where we've been, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and from each of you, 
in your experience, uh, talk to us about what needs to be done going forward. Um, you know, as people live longer, and we hope that, that they'll have, you know, rich and full lives as they live longer, but that is, as we've been talking about, is such a big challenge. What do you think we need to do to help these folks in underserved populations? And what would you like to see? Uh, and I would start, and this is a question for, for everybody on the panel, and I would start with uh, Dr. Gons. Okay. I would like to continue awareness and education. Uh, you know, we've we've really been able to educate our own community here at UHD, the students, the faculty and staff. We've had so many of them step forward and say, hey, I'm taking care of an older adult. Uh, what kind of resources can you provide me, whether it be for caregiving or for going to the doctor or transportation? And so keeping those initiatives up here at the university, but also taking it out to the general community and. Uh, in the fall, we're going to release a groundbreaking baseline report on the status of older adults in Harris County. And with that, what we would we want to do is identify those pockets in Houston and Harris County that are underserved and the trends that we're seeing in those areas. So that's definitely some projects we have going. But again, bringing attention to those needs in those areas um, and, and, and bringing all the resources we can to to the older adults here in Harris County and Houston. All right, and uh, then I would go to uh, Professor Friedman, your thoughts? Well, the, you know, I think we, we've we touched on a lot of important subjects, but I, I believe peer counseling, the opportunity to confer with other people with disabilities or other older adults who are sharing some of the same issues, facing some of the same issues, uh, peer counseling really needs to be facilitated I applaud the Houston Center for Independent Living for the work that they've done in that area, but I think we can do more to promote interaction among people who can help one another solve problems. All right, um, Shemaine, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, and thank you, Lex, for those kind words. We uh, absolutely can always do more uh, peer counseling and other services. I also believe something that's really important is also really bringing those older uh, people with disabilities to the table and talking to them about the technology and how to best support their independence and their participation in these programs. An example of that, HCIL has worked really closely uh, with a lot of seniors since the pandemic to talk about the lack of computer literacy, for instance. And we obtained input from these folks. And so we developed a Chromebook lending library for individuals who didn't have that access to that technology so that we could in turn get that to them and provide that peer counseling that Lex was talking about. And so with that program, we're able to lend them a Chromebook. We're also able to set up Wi-Fi and hotspots and uh, just basic computer access and then teach them how to use those, um, those types of technology. So we've got that in place as a result of just really having folks come to the table and it's vital for their input. And something else that Lex mentioned earlier was that that home and community-based services that's so important. Um, when you think about it, more the statistics show that more than a third of people um, that died from COVID actually died in nursing homes and other institutions. And a lot of those folks were there because they lacked access to those home and community-based services. So we continue to really work with other advocates and organizations and NCOs um, to try to expand those types of services uh, to improve the quality of life and independence for seniors in our community. And again, this has been a really wonderful panel and I uh, thank you for letting us participate. 100%, I, I have absolutely learned a lot over the course of this uh, hour or so. Uh, Kelsey, your thoughts on that from, uh, from Melina's standpoint? Yeah, so, you know, I think from our perspective, certainly continuing to invest in uh, social determinants of health, um, and also, you know, telemedicine, I think, as Dr. Oliverson shared in the beginning, it's not always just about having an iPad or whatever, it's also making sure that you have broadband support. Um, and then I think, you know, there were just some, some things that the, rec the legislature recognized this legislative session about trying to get folks vaccinated and, and realizing that there were some challenges and barriers in some of our homebound uh, members who, you know, um, some of their, their uh, pause providers weren't able to provide vaccines for them. Um, the legislature did pass a bill to allow them to provide you know, COVID vaccines in members' homes. And so that's really helping to support and keep members healthy in their homes. But if they have hesitancy to, to leave their home because of their concerns that there are still other avenues for them to access services. 
Absolutely. And I see uh, Dr. Oliverson is back there on the video. Did, did you have any uh, closing thoughts you'd like to, to offer, Doctor, before we send you back to work there in the Woodlands? Sure, Scott. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's been a, a great uh, panel. Um, I think my take home uh, message that I got in, in our discussion today is that, uh, you know, we, we need to put the health back in health care. And I think one of the things moving forward that's that's clear that this panel has, has made clear is that there's so much more to healthy living, particularly as we get older, than necessarily just being able to take your medications. Um, it's much more multifactorial. Uh, it's outside the box. I, I applaud Melina um, and other of, uh, of the MCOs and groups working on this, um, stakeholders. You know, we need to be more global, more comprehensive and more all-encompassing in the way that we develop strategies to help people live healthier, longer lives, because it's not just about making it to the doctor's visit or being able to go to the hospital. Um, it is where you live. It is what your transportation situation. It is, it's the social aspect. Um, I was really struck by several of the comments I heard as thinking about the isolation and the, and the ultimate depression and disconnection that seniors would feel in terms of just having their lives disrupted. Um, and I think that we need uh, healthcare systems in this country that are going to continue to innovate, think outside the box, and redefine what it means to deliver the health in healthcare. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Appreciate you. And I appreciate uh, Melina and Kelsey, everybody uh, in, in inviting me to uh, be involved in this discussion. I can tell you, um, you know, for the day to day stuff that I cover, which is usually people shouting at each other. It's nice to hear people talking collaboratively and listen to some of the folks who are on this panel talk about different ideas, innovative things they've done, different programs that they put together to try to serve these people who are so important to us. These are our grandparents. These are the people who we love. These are the people that uh, we learn so much from. Um, and as, and it was, as was said during the discussion, it's not just about them. It's about all of us. So Kelsey, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thanks, Scott, Dr. Oliverson, all of our panelists. Um, I, you know, I, I work in healthcare every day and I certainly learned a lot. Um, I appreciate you all sharing your perspectives. Um, I welcome continued partnership and, you know, Melina is continuing to do um, different virtual panels. And so we would welcome and invite you all to continue to join us as we have these across the state. Um, and if you are interested in seeing what Melina is doing, then please feel free to visit melinacares.com backslash Texas about ways that we can support our community. So thank you all for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.